This is a picture test in practical anatomy of the upper limb. You may use the video as a revision for the topic or as a self-assessment tool. For the purpose of self-assessment, you may pause the video and spend your own time to read the question and come up with the answer. Then you can replay the video to confirm your answer by listening to the comments and explanations. Now I will deal with the anatomy of the arm and forearm. This is a view of the axilla showing the axillary artery, cords and branches of the brachial plexus. The pectoral muscles pectoralis major and pectoralis minor are reflected up. Let's try to find the capital M configuration of the medial and lateral cords and their terminal branches. It will serve as a clue for the brachial plexus. This is the lateral cord of the brachial plexus lateral to the axillary artery and this is its continuation here. The lateral cord of the brachial plexus has three branches, the lateral pectoral nerve and then its two large terminal branches, the medial root of the median nerve and the musculocutaneous nerve. Here is the medial cord of the brachial plexus and you can see its two large terminal branches uh, here is the medial root of the median nerve, which joins the lateral root to form the median nerve. And this is the ulnar nerve, the second terminal branch of the medial cord of the brachial plexus. And here you can see the capital M configuration that will help us sort out the branches of the lateral and medial cords of the brachial plexus. The medial root has five branches. The ulnar nerve is one of the terminal branches. The other four are all medial. So we have the medial pectoral nerve here that passes through pectoralis minor. And we have the medial root of the median nerve, which we already mentioned. And then the other two branches are the medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm and the medial cutaneous nerve of the arm. These two nerves are cutaneous branches, that's to say sensory to the skin. The smaller one, A, is the medial cutaneous nerve of the arm and it is shown here to be detached because it supplies the skin of the arm which has been removed in this dissection. The larger one is more medial and it is the medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm which supplies an area of skin indicated by its name, that's to say on the medial side of the forearm. It is longer and still intact in this dissection because it is connected to the skin of the forearm and has nothing to do with the arm. Identify the groove A, which tendon passes in the groove and which muscle is attached to the bone at the depth of the groove. The groove is the intertubercular groove of the humerus. Its name indicates that it lies between two tubercles, intertubercular, the greater and lesser tubercles of the humerus. The groove is also called the bicipital groove since it lodges the tendon of the long head of biceps muscle which arises from the supracondylar tubercle of the scapula within the capsule of the shoulder joint. This tendon then leaves the capsule of the shoulder joint under cover of the transverse humeral ligament which bridges the upper part of the groove. The groove has two lips, medial and lateral, which are downward continuation of the medial lesser tubercle and the larger lateral tubercle. The lateral lip receives the attachment of pectoralis major. The medial lip receives the attachment of another major, which is teres major. And the depth of the groove receives the ribbon-like tendon of latissimus dorsi. Now identify the bony part indicated by the interrupted line B this bony part is the narrow area between the proximal end of the humerus and the shaft of the humerus. It is called the surgical neck of the humerus because it is a common site of fracture. The surgical neck of the humerus should be differentiated from the anatomical neck. The anatomical neck is located distal to the head, between the head and the remaining proximal end containing the greater and lesser tubercles of the humerus. The bone at the surgical neck of the humerus is closely related to the axillary nerve 
as it leaves the posterior wall of the axilla through the quadrangular space below the capsule of the shoulder joint to wind around the surgical neck of the humerus. Thus the nerve is liable to injury during surgical neck fractures. Remember that the axillary nerve is accompanied by the posterior circumflex humeral artery in its course around the surgical neck. Identify the muscle A, what is its nerve supply? This is a slender muscle that belongs to the superficial group of the extensor compartment of the forearm. It is located medial to extensor digitorum, although it is not the most medial of the muscles of the extensor compartment. The most medial one is the extensor carpi ulnaris muscle. Note that this muscle A, proximally, it is attached to the common extensor tendon at the lateral humeral epicondyle. If you follow the tendon of the muscle, you will find that it passes distally beneath the extensor retinaculum. In fact, it passes in the facial compartment over the distal radio ulnar joint. The tendon of the muscle then finds its way toward the little finger, thus the muscle is an extensor muscle of the little digit, hence the name extensor digiti minimi. Note that on the dorsum of the hand, the tendon of extensor digiti minimi divides into two and finally joins the expansion of the extensor digitorum tendon. Now, since the muscle is extensor, then it is innervated by a branch originating from the radial nerve. It is supplied by the posterior interosseous nerve. Remember that the radial nerve, which is derived from posterior divisions of the brachial plexus, is the nerve of the extensor compartments of the arm and forearm. In limb plexuses, like the brachial and lumbar plexus, the anterior divisions of the plexus supply flexor muscles, while the posterior division derivatives supply extensor compartments. In the brachial plexus, the posterior cord, from which the radial nerve originated, is derived from the posterior divisions of the upper, middle, and lower trunks of the brachial plexus. For each of the nerves A and B, identify the nerve from which cord of the brachial plexus it arises and name the artery accompanying each nerve at these locations. This is a deep dissection of the extensor compartment of the arm. Note that the nerve A is located in the spiral groove of the humerus, where it spirals around the shaft of the humerus, downwards and laterally between the lateral and medial heads of triceps muscle. The nerve A is thus the radial nerve, and the spiral groove to which it is closely related is also called the radial groove. It is accompanied by the profunda brachii artery, a branch of the brachial artery. Now, the radial nerve being close to bone at this location, it is vulnerable to injury in humeral mid-shaft fractures. The radial nerve originates from the posterior cord of the brachial plexus, which has five branches, two terminal branches, and these are the radial and axillary nerve, and three other branches, and these are the upper and lower subscapular nerves, and in between them is the thoracodorsal nerve, or the nerve to latissimus dorsi. The radial nerve leaves the axilla through the triangular space inferior to teres major muscle in order to gain access to the posterior compartment of the arm. Now the nerve B is located behind the medial epicondyle of the humerus against which it can be rolled. It is the ulnar nerve. The ulnar nerve lying initially in the flexor compartment of the arm passes gradually backwards to pierce the medial intermuscular septum accompanied by the superior ulnar collateral artery, a branch of the brachial artery, Thus, in the distal half of the arm, and for a short distance, the ulnar nerve lies behind the medial epicondyle of the humerus. And because of its close proximity to the medial epicondyle, it is liable to be injured in fractures of the medial epicondyle of the humerus. The ulnar nerve is derived from the medial cord of the brachial plexus, which has five branches. Apart from the ulnar nerve, all the other branches the other four branches uh, of the medial cord are named medial, so we have medial pectoral, medial root of the median nerve, 
medial cutaneous nerve of the arm and medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm. Injury of which of the nerves A to E results in this limb deformity? This is a wrist drop deformity when the wrist passively drops by the action of gravity and cannot be extended due to paralysis of the extensor muscles of the forearm. These muscles are supplied by a branch originating from the radial nerve. Now let's find the radial nerve in this dissection of the axilla. The dissection shows the median nerve formed by the medial and lateral roots of the median nerve in A, while B, D, and E are branches from the posterior cord of the brachial plexus. This posterior cord can be clearly shown here because the axillary artery has been pushed away, thus clearly showing the cord that lies posterior to the artery, hence the name posterior cord. Remember, the names of the cords of the brachial plexus are derived from their relation to the axillary artery. The posterior cord has five branches. Two of them are the large terminal branches, and this is the radial nerve and the axillary nerve. Then we have the thoracodorsal nerve or nerve to latissimus dorsi muscle going to latissimus dorsi muscle, and it is flanked on either side by the other two branches, the upper and lower subscapular nerves. The axillary nerve, as you can see here, immediately leaves the axilla through the quadriangular space, and this is how to identify it here, while the radial nerve, as you can see, passes toward the arm, crossing in front of the ribbon-like tendon of latissimus dorsi, which serves as a landmark for the radial nerve here. So B is the radial nerve, whose injury will result in the wrist drop deformity. Just to complete the set of nerves, nerve C runs along the mid-axillary line on the surface of serratus anterior muscle, which it supplies. It is not derived from the cords of the brachial plexus, but from the roots of the brachial plexus, and it is the long thoracic nerve derived from the roots C5, 6, and 7. Identify the muscles. Number one is a muscle at the back of the neck, the most superficial muscle here. Look at the entire extent of the muscle. You will find that the muscle is triangular in shape and making with the triangle on the other side, making the shape of a trapezium. That's why the muscle is called the trapezius muscle. And these fibers, in fact, are the upper fibers of trapezius muscle. Two, five, and seven are three groups of fibers belonging to the same muscle, that is the deltoid muscle. You can see the shape of the muscle, triangular, delta-shaped, resembling the Greek letter delta, and the muscle overlies the shoulder joint. It has anterior fibers here in two, arising from the lateral part of the clavicle. Five represent the middle fibers of the muscle, the abductor part of the muscle, arising from the acromion, and seven, represents the posterior fibers that arise from the spine of the scapula. Three is the muscle of the flexor compartment of the arm, most superficial muscle. It is the biceps brachii muscle. Opposite to it on the other side is the triceps muscle, the muscle of the extensor compartment of the arm. Four is a muscle running from the arm, crossing the elbow, and is located on the lateral side of the forearm. This is the brachioradialis muscle. Eight arises from the lateral border of the scapula, the cisteres major muscle, and together with the tendon of latissimus dorsi here, it forms the posterior axillary fold. So eight is teres major muscle. 